Hi. It's about time to do a review of libido. A few episodes ago, I did the unboxing ritual for that, and uh, no one heard the scream. So a lot of people watched that video, so that's kind of cool. It's probably just the graphic I picked. Um, I am relaxing today. I'm the most out of pain I've been in in a long time. So to help keep it there through the evening, I'm having a few of these adult beverages. So if I get more wonky than usual, if that's possible, then uh, this is why. Uh, I don't know if you guys like ganja and hess. That's amazing. Ooh, it's amazing ganja and hess t-shirt. I had that for a while, but anyway, didn't know if I'd worn out here yet. So I'm gonna talk about libido. I'm probably gonna do some cheat cheating on some of the fine details over here on the other screen, but uh 1965, it's a Jallo, one of the early Jallos, it's in black and white, uh, which I think is amazing um so so severin put this blu-ray out and as usual they did an incredible restoration job it's, it's so clean and tight looking and crisp um i had seen the movie once before and i liked it but uh seeing a you know okay print on youtube is not not the same as watching the uh restoration on uh on a big high def tv um so this movie stars Giancarlo Giannini, really his first significant film role. Uh, when I so first saw the movie, I didn't even know he was in it. You know, I'd seen him from, I'd seen him in uh, several Lena Wertmuller films, um, in which I really liked his performances. Uh, I think he also was in the movie Hannibal by Ridley Scott, which is kind of a eh, not very good adaptation of a really great book. Um, Mara Merrill, who, who is the wife, was then and is still the wife of Ernesto Gostaldi, who wrote this film. Uh, she is the co-star. Um, and Alan Collins. Now, I always forget this cat's uh, birth name. Uh, so I'm going to cheat a little bit and see if I can uh, get the necessary info here. Uh, Luciano Pagosi. So I think Tim Lucas called him the, the Italian Peter Lorre. Uh, you know, he's usually he's short. He's a short guy like me. Uh, he's losing his hair back here, kind of like I'm starting to. And uh, you know, he he's a really good character actor. Sometimes he plays like a red herring in these kind of movies, uh, like you know, a squirrely kind of creepy guy. And most times he's just that a, a red herring. It's not really he's he's not really the murderer or anything, but. I really like his presence in films. I believe he's in Blood and Black Lace. I'm pretty sure he's in a lot. If I sit and think about it, he, he's in a few, a couple of Avas. Um, but anyway, his his uh, international stage name was Alan Collins. Um, uh, and then there's another lady, Dominique Bochero, who I'm really not familiar with at all. I don't even think I've seen her, to my knowledge, in any other films. Um, so like I said, Ernesto Gastaldi wrote this film. Uh, according to the lore, uh, Maestro Gastaldi, uh, wrote the film on a bet, I guess that he, could he do it, uh, in a certain amount of time or do it at all, and, um, the original idea, I'm not sure how extensive it was, but it did come from, uh, Mara Merrill, uh, his wife, um, and she kind of is, you know, to be expected, if you talk about red herrings, you know, you get near the end. I'm pretty sure Ernesto said that Tim Lucas told him something to the effect of it's the first Jalo I've seen where I couldn't guess the ending or the killer or the truth, you know, uh, before the ending. Um, so I had forgotten the ending. So when I watched it this, this time the other day, like all the way through, um, I kept thinking, okay, so Mara Merrill, it's her idea. She's the co-star. She's his wife. The key to this has got to be her. She's got to be... She's got to be the real culprit behind everything. Um, kind of like the, the, the silly girl in, uh, at the end of 
Bob is five dollars for an August moon. And he never suspect this this chick, and, and she walks away with all the money with this incredible uh, Stelvio uh, Cipriani music playing. So, um, yeah, so he he filmed it uh, in eighteen days, and uh, maybe that was the bet. How quick could he film it? Uh, his assistant director Vittorio uh, Salerno. I don't know much about him. Um, I will say that uh, a lot of information about the movie uh, is on the disc in the form of a very long interview with Gastaldi himself on camera. Okay, so full disclosure, I know Ernesto Gastaldi not well or anything. We're not like buddies, but pals. But you know, we have we have corresponded via my film group, Deep Images. He's a member. He's probably the most you know famous, celebrated member. Uh, and he does post, he does contribute and interact. Uh, he's a great guy. He's a legend, really. Uh, before this video is over, I'm going to name off uh, some of the movies he's been associated with. And you, you may know them, you may not, but you'll be like, oh my God, this guy's incredibly prolific and creative. Uh, I think he kind of helped shape the dimensions of the Jallo, uh, you know, because he was fascinated with the whole mystery thing you know um, like how does the plot mechanism work how do you plant certain seeds how do those seeds bloom um, how do you make the ending the surprise ending jibe with all the information you had previously given uh, to the viewer uh, or as reader in the case of some of the people who influenced the Jallos like Edgar Wallace or Agatha Christie you know a lot of films have been based on or inspired by the work of one or the other of those uh, in, in the mystery genre, in the uh, mystery thriller genre, in the, um, the Krimis in Germany, and then, of course, the Jallos in Italy, which to me, the Jallos are like the terminal point for mysteries. They're like mystery books taken to the extreme. My mom collected mystery books and read them, so I knew the names of a lot of these authors by the time I was in elementary school. I'd read some Agatha Christie and a couple of others. Um, um, you know, the guy who wrote the Lou Archer books, my brain's blanking, McDonald, and um, a few. Uh, I wanted to get into them more because, you know, I liked things that were kind of, you know, I love comic books and soap operas. So I like, I like storytelling, I like action, I like weird stuff. Um, I really kind of bond closer uh, with my mom. I gave her a box set of Agatha Christie uh, uh, mass market paperbacks with uh, new printings and beautiful paintings of Miss Marple on the cover, uh, you know, the protagonist of a lot of her stories. Um, my mom, you know, she actually cried. And she actually said, this is the greatest gift you've ever given me because it's like something I actually really want and really can enjoy. People give so many gifts that are so perfunctory or, you know, the guesswork involved uh, or, or you buy something utilitarian like clothing or whatever. And, and, you know, so when you actually know what your parent likes and it's like a niche kind of thing and you can do that's the only time I was able to do that for either of my parents that, that I remember. So may, maybe I did, but that was the time, only time she remarked and it was pretty amazing. So I guess I was about uh, 10 or 12, 10, uh, yeah. Uh, so it was like my allowance I bought it with. Basically, my dad went with me to Sears. There's Roebuck at, at a mall near here called South Park. Decades before the show, there was a South Park Mall here in here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, Sears would have a, a little little. Um, you can walk in. There's a little kiosk. I don't know if it had a register or not. And then you had had some jewelry, and then it had like books, a rack of books, and you know, mass markets mainly. And that's where I first saw. Um, that is where I first saw uh, and bought Philip Jose Farmer's Tarzan Alive which a uh, book that strongly influenced my life path. Um, so anyway, that's where I got back to the Christie box. So that was, that was a nice time looking at books, browsing books and comics. Uh, that was the kind of stuff that I was into as a kid. I wasn't into like rough housing and outdoorsy stuff and sports. So <laughs> I'm just the same way now. Um, and in any case, so Mr. Gastaldi is a member of, of my group. He's very cool. And there's a long interview with him in which he kind of discusses the ins and outs of making this. 
talks about Giancarlo, and you know, Giancarlo is kind of inexperienced on camera, uh, but you know, he still did a good job. His character is you're not sure what the key to the character is, which that's the really the biggest mystery because no one's really killed till near the end, and it's really kind of a um, set bound, you know, it's like it's in a house. They go to this house to settle Christian, played by Giancarlo, settle his estate. His father has died. Now, years before, his father had had this special room with all these reflective mirrors, kind of like, you know, an Enter the Dragon, excuse me. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the kinds that are really, especially back then, really a bitch to, to shoot without getting reflections of the equipment and people. Um, beautifully shot. Uh, cinematographer is Romolo Garoni. I think he goes a long way to selling this look and vibe of this film. It's very quintessentially, to me, 1965. I mean, it, it's you can tell it was May 1965, and that is a good thing. That was a great era for all the R's. So, um, so he got this mirrored room, and he has this woman chained up, played by Mara Merrill. <laughs> Only supposed to be naked, and discovering her is like this. Uh, tiger print <laughs> sheet and i think he's been like torturing her and then he kills her and you know they give a quote about the libido at the beginning i think it's from freud i can't remember i should know this and uh but you know it's basically putting a psychological grounding in this like you know saying the libido it, you know is the key to in other words some people like christian's father their libido is stimulated by you know, torture and murder of beautiful women. Now, of course, you could say the antagonists of 90% of Jallos are the exact same way. They all share this libidinous quality. Um, so anyway, he goes there, and you can kind of tell he doesn't want to be there, but, you know, everyone else around him is kind of doting on him because he's kind of a he's kind of a timid and, and odd guy, and he's haunted by the fact he walked in on his father killing the woman in the mirrored room as a child. Because in childhood trauma... And most, and quite a lot of classic Jallos is all rooted in childhood. And another motif they use, which is in tons of Jallos and even non jallo Italian genre films of that period, is the music box. So he's got this music box that kind of plays this funny little ding, 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 ding and turns real slowly. And the character, I don't know if it's intended to be, but he looks exactly like the Mr. Peanut uh, of... Uh, I can't remember. It's like the most famous Peanut brand. My bl brain went blank, but... Mr. Peanut's the character, and he's a peanut. He's an anthropomorphic peanut. He's dressed in a kind of a suit, and he's, you know, a hat. He's very debonair. He's doffing his hat. So, you know, they use the, um, they use the music box in, you know, in Bamba and Argento. He's, and Sergio Leone uses the music box, and I think it's for a few dollars more, I believe. Um, you know, it triggers the memories. You know, it, it's indelibly... Uh, associated with the traumatic event. So, in the present day, well, back then, 1965, Christian still has this fucking Mr. Peanut music box. I'm not sure why he kept it. Uh, but eventually you start to think, well, you know, he's going to follow the route of his father. So he's there with his fiance. She seems a little blasé. She's somewhat helpful. And there with his lawyer, played by Alan Collins, and Alan Collins' wife, played by Mar Merrill. So, a lot of creepy things happen around the house, and Christian somehow starts to believe that father's alive, he's in the house, uh, and he's stalking them. And of course, the other implication is, you know, whether the father's alive or not, uh, is Christian going to turn out like his father? And why does Alan Collins' wife, Mar Merrill, why does she look almost exactly like Christian's mother? Um, kind of a weird mystery. I don't think that part's ever explained exactly. Maybe, maybe. Uh, so it's kind of a round and around. It's a lot of atmosphere, and a lot, it, it, to some people, probably kind of talky. It goes into a lot of psychology. Some, some for that time, contemporary sound, deep psychology. Some kind of pop psychology, more philosophical, you know, speculation. Um. But all like you know, all well written by Mr. Gastaldi. So, um, so yeah. What uh, eventually uh, it seems like Christian started beating his fiance 
like blacking out and doing it. And he doesn't remember the next day. He's reverted to like this childlike persona, like the kid who was traumatized with holding Mr. Peanut. <laughs> that was a weird sentence. And um, it's all a scam, man. So I was trying to unravel it. First, it looks as though Alan Collins, lawyer, is, is the bad guy. You know, what's, what's this guy's name? Uh, his name's Paul. He's the lawyer. So it looks like Paul is kind of fucking with Christian, leaving these clues, trying to, you know, he wants to get the money uh, because, um, because you know, uh, Helene, maybe, she's only the fiance, according to the subject matter here, or the uh, printed material. I got the pressure from the movie she was, uh, Paul's, I mean, um, Christian's wife, but so, but for some reason she's going to be entitled to uh, this inheritance if anything happens to Paul. Um, and Bridget, uh, you know, Bridget's kind of like clueless about the whole thing. Seemingly, she's very doe-eyed and kind of so pseudo glamorous, and uh, you know, she dances around kind of provocatively, and she carries this transistor radio or other. Carlo Rusty Kelly did the music. He's amazing. You know, he did uh, Blood and Black Laces score for Baba. He did this gorgeous uh, music for Baba's uh, Whip in the Body. Uh, very, very, very talented uh, musician and composer. So, uh, yeah, so he composes this music box theme. He composes this kind of, you know, pop beat kind of instrumental jam that she keeps playing on her on her transistor radio it's very of its time but it's it's also very very timeless and exciting if you like that kind of music which i do then it's pretty pretty fun um it gives kind of a slight kitschy quality to it um there are some doomy cues and you know foreboding cues of course uh and they're fine they're not his best work but you know they set the tone sometimes they're a little heavy um but it works um so yeah, eventually it seems to me that Paul the lawyer is like instrumental behind this because uh, they're trying to like frame up Christian and take his money. That seems to be the direction it's going. But uh, Helene, the the fiance, insists. You know, Christian beat me, and she shows him then these scars on her face. So that puts a really twist. So that they kind of decide to put Christian under house arrest, and you know, uh, trying trying to deal with him if he reverts to this crazed maniac. Uh, persona that he allegedly inherited from his, his dear old dad and that's when things start to head towards the direction of the, the red herrings and the, and the the clues starting to add up to something a bit different than maybe you thought it was at first i mean i wasn't sure i didn't remember the ending and i i thought the lawyer i just thought alan collins's character was so the way they direct him he's so ambiguous with his glances and you know, they do this in a lot of mysteries all, all across the board, or used to anyway. But we have a character who kind of glances at the camera like that, and and that's to throw you off and give you a clue. Uh, I'll tell you a funny instance of that in a recent movie that really threw me off was Dark Knight. Because, um, <laughs> like, every scene that this one cop is in, the Hispanic uh, female cop, whenever the scene starts to clothes or like her and Gordon and the crew start to go off somewhere or Batman leaves and scene changes. She turns, does that kind of thing to the audience. First time I watched it, I thought nothing of it. And you know why? It's because I've been conditioned to accept that that's just a red herring. So then it turns out she is the Joker's agent. <laughs> um, and so when you watch it a second time, I love the movie, but it's, it's almost ridiculous. I mean, it's smashing you, it's smashing you in the face in every scene she's in, really, if, if, if you really are circumspect. So in this case, I didn't know which, you know, which angle to, to approach it from. Um, but basically, um, Brigitte Mar Mar Merrill, uh, she lures her husband I mean, this is a very nice palatial house that's overlooking kind of a cliffside in the sea. Uh, and the father died by jumping off that cliff to his death after committing the murder. I think the kids saw the jumping off the cliff part, too. So two murders in one day, that's pretty rough for a 10-year-old who just wants to play with his peanuts. So, you know, they are 
uh, out on the cliffs, uh, the couple, and uh, well, actually, it's just him. It's it, it's Paul. He's looking for her. He finds her shoe, and then these black gloves push him to his death on the cliff. By that time, I was thinking, it's Bridget. And it was Bridget. And, of course, she sashays in, back into the house. She's playing her music. Everything's cool because Christian's completely insane because Christian has just found the dead body of Helene. Obviously, Christian did it, right? Because he's turned into a maniac, and they're going to lock him in that room, and they're going to put him away, and, and uh, she's going to get the inheritance, But which is a bit, a bit of a stretch. But um, So... It turns out that she's alive, um, and Helene, and a la Les Diabolique, which this is compared to sometimes. Uh, the two women were, well, Les Diabolique, you know, the two women are trying to, you know, gaslight and kill the, the man, and then you find out one of the woman, women is in league with the man, he's actually alive. So in this case, uh, the woman's trying to gaslight the man, and uh, by making him think he killed the other woman. But in fact, the other woman is alive and they're in jointly gaslighting Christian. So he's kind of probably sitting back in the fetal position somewhere, comatose, so they think, your catatonia. And um, they have a little catty scene. You know, they were partners all along. And this, of course, kind of scene recurs in many jallos after this, including some, I believe, written by, by, uh, by the maestro here. And so it's kind of funny Except it's, a whims it's whimsical. There's a there's a whimsical undertone to this. I don't know if it's intentional. Uh, like there's he's kind of winking at us, you know. Um, but yeah, it's got a darkness to it. Uh, I, I, that balance is hard to pull off. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, and I don't know, Mr. Gustaldi, I don't think I don't know if he's addressed this in an interview that I have seen or read. Uh, I'm sure he has, but. I think this movie, in a way, the template for this film, just so early, was The Girl Who Knew Too Much, uh, which came out, I think, two years earlier, maybe three, uh, known in America in theaters at the time as The Evil Eye. But I've got a Blu-ray that has both cuts, The Evil Eye and The Girl Who Knew Too Much. That, that's an incredible film. And that's generally marked as, like, the first Jowl. Uh, so before we did Blood and Baba did Blood and Black Lace, we're talking about Mario Bava, by the way, not Lamberto, who, who got lost. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a black and white movie, and it, it's shot even more sumptuously and beautifully. But anything shot or directed by Bava is going to be shot beautifully. I think Bava himself shot um, Girl Who Knew Too Much. I can't remember. He shot a lot of his, and Ubaldo, Ubaldo Terzani, he's an incredible cinematographer that worked with Bava. But two and two of them, they... Anyway, this one isn't about Baba. It's about Gastaldi and this great movie. So, uh, boom, uh, girlfriend uh, Bridget blasts away Helen. And now she's blindly walking around with her transistor radio. She's got no care in the world. All she's got to do is call the police and say, you know, Christian killed, Christian killed uh, his fiance. And then they're like, oh, and so you're the next in line. Um, I kind of feel like uh, Helen must have hatched this idea and deliberately found a woman who looked like Christian's mother and then kind of introduced her to the lawyer and then kind of let nature take its course. This is just my theory about the background. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And if Mr. Gastaldi watches this, please tell me I'm wrong. All right. Um, so it looks all cool, but then Christian actually does snap. Um, and basically he, uh, he knocks her out. He chokes her so hard and renders her unconscious. And then he begins tearing off her clothes. Now, I, since I didn't remember the ending, I thought, well, he's just going to go and rape her. They're just, you know, back then they're just going to cut though. Um, you know, 1982 Jallo, they just show him raping her, you know? Um, so, uh, no, instead he, he binds her or she, she can't break out. She's naked with the leopard skin print and in the room of mirrors, which she loves. I mean, the character expressed how cool that room was. And she dances around and listening to her, you know, music, which is just a great scene. Um, 
And Christian, you know, she's trying to get him to free her. And Christian goes to the cliff and he starts playing with Mr. Peanut and listening to the damn box. And then he just <laughs> falls off the cliff. He doesn't really jump. He just he lazily just falls off the cliff. So she's never going to get out. She's just, just basically going to, I guess, starve to death there. She wanted the house. She wanted to be the last one standing. She got what she wished. Look out, Bridget. Karma can get you. And um, and that's the movie. Uh, I, I love it. Uh, it. It just has a cool mood. Uh, it's important for its placement in history. Uh, the fact that they went to this restoration, the trouble for this restoration is, is you know, more testament to how incredible Severin is. And, you know, I've talked about them constantly. Disclaimer, I, I don't work for Severin or any of their subsidiaries. I just have a fan. I had to pay for this, like everyone else. I didn't have the money. Did I buy this one or did the other guy donate this one to me? I did a few pre-orders before I became totally broke, and then around that, that time, uh, Tim and uh, Terry started donating a lot of stuff. So if you want to donate, please donate whatever you want me to review to the channel, and I will review it. Uh, if you want to donate to my... GoFundMe or PayPal, I could use it. I'm still maintaining a survival fund. Times are getting more dire each day, really, and I'm trying to keep a gray face. Uh, in fact, I'm on a lot of meds really does help. Uh, and, and this, too. And, and, and I don't want to hear any lectures about mixing them because I know about interactions. So I'm a chemist. No, I'm kidding. Um, meth doesn't count. No, I'm, I'm joking, but... Uh, so, you might hear in the background that, that music. I have the movie playing now. I hope it's not drowning me out or fucking up my sound here. Uh, it is an Ur Jallo. So, yeah, any, to me, any Jallo before, say, 1967 is, because there's quite a few in that 64, 66 window, and several are black and white, and some of them are kind of naive and, and not that eventful, and some are very closely patterned after the black and white creamy films. Um, but yeah, it was an interesting kind of a transitional period. And then Baba himself stepped up and began escalating. I might have this too loud. I'm probably going to screw this whole video up. I forgot how much screaming there was. So uh, it is a horror movie. Gastaldi, like I said, contributes in a long interview, talks about the making of the movie, talks about the actors, uh, and talks about his wife a lot. And he, he gets very frank. He's a very open guy. Uh, well, he also talks about the following for this movie and how he befriended Tim Lucas, and they bonded over it. And now he says, you know, Tim Lucas became my online friend. And he's he's pushing 90, and he's very active on social media. Uh, I mean, anybody that's going to take the time of their day to contribute uh, two, two posts every other day to, to my group is, you know, I know he posts the other groups, too. all the film groups he's in, he posts. Um, I guess what, you know, I, I, I get that. I mean, I, I, if I were in his position, that's exactly what I'd be doing, using the Internet to touch base with my fan base and kind of see how my work has held up through the years through their eyes and how younger people uh, feel about my work. And uh, several artists have, you know, do this, have done this. It's pretty cool. And... Gastaldi uh, basically kind of talks about his wife. They're still married. She's still alive, but she's kind of in a permanent, I guess, assisted living kind of situation, has Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, and that happened, I think he said, around 2014. I may be misremembering it. Um, and then progressed. And you can tell he's just heartbroken about it. He's still in love with her. And he, so he's been married to her all these years. Good Lord. So that's, he's, they've been married longer than I've been alive. It's amazing. So, um, so it's a great, it's a great Blu-ray. It's a great package. I got this limited edition slip cover, which is just an alternate kind of poster. I'm trying to figure out what thumbnail I'll use for this because the one I used for the unboxing is very popular and caught people's eye. So I can't really reuse that in good conscience. So I'm going to wrap this up. I, I don't need to have a long one. I just wanted to make sure that I reviewed this movie since I, I, I've gone through so much trouble of acquiring it and talking about it in the other video and leading up to this. 
and, and, and spending a lot of time with it on, either watching, engaging with it, or listening to it with uh, Cat Ellinger's commentary, which I've raised in one of my last videos, or watching uh, Meister's interview. So thank you for watching. Uh, we're going to take the cheat notes away, and I'm going to be back soon uh, with something new. Thank you. Rock on.